we're here this morning with Dr. Alex Lees, who's come down to talk to us about the kind of landscapes we've been flying over. He's an expert in biodiversity and climate change. Alex, can you just introduce yourself a bit more broadly than that? What's your background? Uh, so currently I'm a senior lecturer uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, I'm interested in uh, land use change and how that interacts with biodiversity loss or biodiversity gain uh, and with climate change. I do most of my work uh, in the Brazilian Amazon in the tropical forests, but I'm now a stakeholder here in the UK, live on the edge of the Peak District, uh, and I'm obviously very uh, uh, interested in improving biodiversity and climate outcomes uh, close to my home these days too. Could you give us a broad overview of the connection between biodiversity and climate change? The, um, they've been connected now and they're hopefully being more connected in global policy because they need to be, but why is that? Can you explain that simply? So two angles to that, I guess. Uh, biodiversity includes uh, woody biomass, so all the trees in the world contain carbon as well as being species in their own right, deserving protection and, and, and playing host to you know, a huge uh, myriad of, of other species. Uh, and then below ground, we also have carbon. So carbon, which was historically biodiversity, uh, in terms of up in our peatlands here, you know, most of it's sphagnum moss, for instance. So uh, our interest is in preserving above and below ground uh, carbon, uh, and with that we preserve biodiversity. Uh, and there may occasionally be uh, instances where, for instance, you know, planting uh, uh, trees on peat bogs might be a bad idea, so we have to think very carefully and strategically about how we uh, make sure we don't have a mismatch between biodiversity conservation goals and, and, and carbon conservation goals, but largely they're broadly aligned. And so you mentioned briefly then carbon in the soil as well and with, with sphagnum moss as a reference. What about in terms of farmland? We've been flying over quite a lot of what is now farmland. Soil carbon you know, in some areas is incredibly important. Often in, in grazed areas can have quite high, high proportions of soil carbon, whereas often arable areas quite quite low soil carbon. In some parts of Britain, for instance, in the Fenland Basin, which we're going to get over to that side of the country, to, mm -hmm. to East Anglia, then areas there used to have incredible carbon stores, which have been lost. So if you fly over somewhere like uh, Wiccan Fen or Woodwalton Fen, you'll see that these uh, isolated areas of natural habitat are now sort of metres above the surrounding farmland. So huge loss uh, of, of carbon in those areas, but also huge loss in biodiversity. Uh, and the Fenlands were amongst the richest landscapes in the UK, but were, were drained you know, thousands of years ago because they're uh, the best quality soils, if you like. And that's what's caused the loss in carbon, is it? Draining that's, the That's draining what's the caused land. the loss in carbon in the lowlands uh, and in the uplands as well. So uh, in the uplands, for instance, in the Peak District or North York Moors and the Pennines, we've seen a degradation of, of those systems uh, by industrial pollution, which has you know, killed off a lot of that sphagnum moss, attempts at drainage, uh, to basically include, uh, increase their agricultural productivity. Some of those areas have been repeatedly burnt for, for land management reasons, such as uh, sort of increasing the, the density of red grouse. And other areas have been planted with non-native conifers, and all of those uh, end up driving loss of, of carbon and loss of biodiversity. I first came uh, across you on Twitter making pretty blunt comments um, aimed at Royal Mail about a series of stamp, stamps that they had put out. Uh, to celebrate the Peak District. Um, can you explain that and what were your comments about it? They were pretty standard shots of, or picturesque shots of the Peak District landscape. Yeah. So it was a set of stamps, I think it was celebrating all of our national parks. And the one which annoyed me was a, a shot of the Peak District where I'm based, which again looks quite a lot like a lot of landscapes do in Upland Britain. So it was an area that's predominantly a grouse moor. There were obvious big erosion gullies on that, on that moorland area because of this, this historic management regimes. It basically created a landscape of very, very low resilience and low biodiversity. And, and my take was why are we sort of showcasing you know, some of the poorest bits of our national parks, which have, have become something we all sort of, or many people have accepted as the norm, when in fact they're sort of emblematic of a failure at, at conserving both biodiversity and carbon. Uh, I think there are lots of uh, areas which do deserve to be on our stamps from national parks, but I certainly thought that shot of a grouse moor wasn't uh, among them, which I would certainly personally feature. And the particular features, you could even see some of the scarring, couldn't you, on that in the yeah. image? So scars from uh, recurrent burns, so uh, red grouse, uh, management for red grouse uh, entails uh, repeatedly burning moors to create a, 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 a mosaic age of uh, it's sort of different ages of heather which the, the grouse eat for instance 
Uh, and then the historical attempts at drainage, most of that was more for improving agriculture, but I think some of that's also been to sort of encourage heather, rather than, which is not particularly tolerant of very wet areas, for instance. Uh, and then it's also associated with persecution of, of native predators as well. So lots of sort of controversy over grouse moors. Although I would add that, you know, if we replace a grouse moor with a plantation, then we would equally be failing to try and conserve mm -hmm. biodiversity and carbon. So maybe we need to be pragmatic about management goals. And what, for you personally, is the reason behind now looking more closely at the British landscape where your background has largely been in tropical landscapes? Why are you now interested in Britain? So, I mean, I've always been interested in Britain. Uh, my first visit, for instance, to the, the Peak District was when I was probably eight years old, uh, going up to try and see moorland birds like merlins and, and hen harriers, which obviously wasn't a possibility, and black grouse, which I saw for the first time uh, in the Peak District aged about 11. And it's now a species which is extinct in the region. So we've seen, you know, change, uh, some gains, but a lot of losses of species. In your lifetime, and you're not old. <laughs> no, I'm not, no, not old. So it was a bird which was last present in the Peak District about uh, in the sort of late 1990s, it disappeared and it had con gradually contracted from five to three to, to a single site at Swallow Moss in Staffordshire, which lots and lots of people visited from the Midlands because it was the closest place you could go and see that spectacular species, but which has subsequently disappeared. And many of the lessons you sort of learn about land management and, uh, and trade-offs between uh, conservation and development and ecosystem service provision that we work on in the tropics, well, they equally apply here too. And um, having lived in Brazil for quite a long time, having moved back to this area, you sort of see echoes of, of landscapes which in Brazil, you know, if you're looking at a bare hillside covered in eucalyptus uh, plantation, w which was once rainforest, we, we obviously recognise that as being an uh, environmental crime, if you like, in a way, right? I mean, it's yeah. someone's farm. But essentially, those changes have, have played out in the UK landscape. But over so long, we've sort of forgotten the history of what the mm. landscape could look like. And I think it's very difficult for me to, to speak to Brazilian farmers to the, the need for restoration, uh, exactly. then not to do the same thing back home and to make a better effort. And quite often people out there would sort of throw that back in my face and yeah. say, well, you've you cut down your forest 2,000 years ago. And, and I'll be saying, well, we knew that was a problem. So then, then they'd follow back, so why haven't you restored it? And then you sort of really Stop. struck for a response. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm finding a similar thing. So that's been one of the... We've obviously th flown through some pretty... Um, challenging landscapes coming from Scotland and now down through the Lake District but on the whole farmers have been really great about us landing in the fields. Um, firstly they're very interested in chatting. This paramotor landing in their field is quite a, a memorable moment for most people. Um, they're generally happy to talk about biodiversity and potentially or stuff that they might have seen disappear in their in their lifetime. Maybe some changes in the landscape um, when it comes to talking about climate change, there's quite a lot of people who would consider themselves uh, cynic. We've had of both, but some that would consider themselves cynic, but they don't seem to be cynics about whether climate change exists or is happening. More they're rejecting the general, uh, the current narrative, I suppose, the public narrative of farmers are doing lots of things bad. Clearly, we do have to have some changes in the way we manage land. Um, but what do you think we, we do about that, the fact that farmers are kind of potentially not wanting to talk climate change because they feel that it's really the public saying you've done stuff bad, where they just feel that they've been serving the public for decades and feeding, the, feeding us all? Yeah, well, I think that's the first point there is I think we need to recognise that, that farmers have tended to do what we've asked of them. A lot of the sort of the increase and in intensification of farming happened, you know, uh, around and after the Second World War when there was a big drive to become more self-sufficient in food. And we did that, which was a huge sort of uh, uh, worry at levels of governance and, and everyone else that, you know, we needed to be be have better food security. And that intensification came at a big cost for, for habitats and for wildlife. Mm. Uh, I think we're in a different position now and able to make some more pragmatic decisions and we have a, a different agricultural toolkits and can potentially produce more food in a smaller area and, and also probably change the way we eat and the things we eat. But I think, you know, we've asked, we've asked a lot of farmers in the past. I think we recognised, we've recognised that they, they did what we asked and we're now coming here asking again. Uh, uh, and it's not to say that... Um, everything that these people have done is bad, which quite plainly it isn't, but we do have to have that discussion and think, well, how can we improve biodiversity and carbon outcomes whilst maintaining healthy farming communities? And mm. 
I'm as worried as anyone else about rural depopulation and about the ageing cohorts of farmers. And I think we need, we need more farmers uh, and more perhaps tech-savvy farmers and, and more biodiversity and carbon-savvy farmers. And that's the way we need to be moving forward, not saying, well, we'll, we'll sell farming down the river and give up at producing food at home, simply because lots of the biodiversity we are interested in maintaining is associated with farm and landscapes. So I have some footage from the sort of landscapes we've been flying over. I'd love to have your take on it. So this is, this is site, um, this is Hall's Water. Okay, so yeah, so this is an extremely famous uh, Lake District Valley, uh, somewhere that which has changed dramatically uh, in my lifetime. So the only time I actually visited Hall's Water, I think it was in 1989, uh, sort of a very impressionable uh, nine-year-old boy uh, wanting to see golden eagles. Oh, yeah. uh, and this was, at the time, the only site... You didn't site see Golden Eagles. I did see Golden Eagles. It was the first place I saw Golden Eagle uh, in, in, in Britain. And at the time, it was the only place which, where Golden Eagle occurred in England. And subsequently, that species has been lost from Hawes Water and, and lost from England. Uh, so a, a tale, basically, of a landscape which wasn't delivering because the species wasn't particularly persecuted there, which is one problem with Golden Eagle populations mm -hmm. in the UK. They're sort of limited by persecution because of conflicts human-wildlife conflicts, if you like. Yeah. But in the Lake District, they're probably limited by their lack of a prey base, so not enough suitable animals for golden eagles to eat. And, and why is that? Well, it's because of a landscape which at the time was incredibly intensively grazed, you know, through the 60s and, and 70s because of those headage payments. But subsequent to that, the horse water you've just seen in that video there looks very, very different. So we see lots of regeneration happening on the slopes. This is natural regeneration as well. Yeah, natural and, and regeneration. And would you prefer that to rapid plantation? Absolutely, yeah. So it's, uh, there's obviously been a push from some sectors of the economy that, that, that see this opportunity in, uh, in trying to sequester as much carbon as quickly as possible. That One way of doing that would be to be uh, planting uh, uh, Sitka spruce or, or lodgepole pines or other non-native tree species, which is one answer to the climate because crisis. Because they grow really quickly. Because they grow very quickly, yeah. sequester lots of carbon, but they do not deliver biodiversity. So the, they have their place, I guess, and perhaps it would be good if we were less dependent on imports of timber, but they're not a catch-all for a solution because they, they offer very little for, for wild nature. So uh, I'd love to see far more sort of scrubification, if you like, of our hillsides because they produce habitat for lots of species which are declining at landscape scales, things like wind chats, uh, nightjars use this sort of habitat in the, in the peaks, uh, lots of rare butterflies, for instance, mm -hmm. as well. So it's just a case of sort of drawing down on those livestock numbers and potentially diversifying livestock as well. Mm. You know, not just sheep, but also having some big hairy cows up on those hills because they help to sort of break up the, uh, the very um, intense swarms of things like purple moorgrass, which can uh, basically sort of uh, take, uh, take over essentially all the, all the other species. So there are sort of farming fixes, if you like, to the, the, climate, the, the biodiversity crisis and which can help the climate crisis too. But we need to be very wary of some e what might look like easy solutions and certainly sort of very aware of that mantra of the, the right tree in the right place. Do you think we can convince enough land managers to make these kind of changes and fast enough for the kind of rapid turnaround that people are talking, around, talking about, like the 2030 goals? Uh, whether we can meet those goals by 2030, I'm not sure. Whether we can be on the way to meet those goals goals certainly and it's going to be incredibly dependent on whatever the future of environmental subsidies look like in this country and we're sort of currently living in a moment of massive uncertainty of what this might look like but if we want more biodiverse farmland landscapes uh, and more biodiverse uplands then we need to to make sure that the the environment the, the sort of financial preconditions for, for farmers to, to meet those those goals are, are, are met so and can you understand why farmers are cynical or are at least rejecting the climate narrative, which is that you've done everything badly, you've depleted carbon in soils, carbon in our biodiversity, now mend the error of your ways? I can, I can see that problem. I mean, it's similar, I can borrow the, another example from Brazil, where a lot of the areas where we worked, it was the government incentivized colonization of those areas mm. through the 70s and 80s, and people went there and did what the government said, and the government turns around and says, actually, this wasn't a great idea. Although at the moment the government's still saying it is a good idea in Brazil, for instance, right. but that's, that's another story for another day. Yeah. Um, but essentially, yes, we, we need to sort of recognise, as I said before, that we need to, to move forward in these areas. 
Uh, combating cynicism for carbon might be tough, and I guess it depends on whatever media the, the, the farmers are digesting. Uh, and I guess we're also perhaps unfair when we see narratives coming from sort of some green groups, for instance, showing huge cattle feedlot operations in, in, in the United States, for instance, and saying, well, animal agriculture is always bad. Uh, mm. When, for instance, we might have a farmer with you know 26 uh, uh, dairy cattle, like my grandfather once did in Essex, replete with all sorts of species of conservation yeah. certain on their farm. So we need to be very careful about who we are labelling as bad, because it might be an indus industry might be overwhelmingly bad at a global scale, but a local scale they might be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. There's another clip that I'd be really interested to show you. This one is of Ennerdale, um, which is another site I think you know. Yeah, so uh, I had the good fortune to visit Ennerdale a, a few years ago, and this has become one of those sort of flagship rewilding projects uh, and a vision perhaps of what, you know, a lot more of the Lake District might hopefully look like. So attempts basically to, to fail uh, to fence off uh, sheep uh, along some of the, uh, the hillsides there to encourage uh, natural uh, regeneration of what ecologists might term sort of essentially temperate rainforest vegetation mm. which there are already sort of quite large fragments in that valley already of very high uh, tall if you like primary uh, original old growth uh, forest and why has that survived there for whatever happenstance that no one has cut it down essentially okay. which is something which this sort of old growth forest if you like comes by different names names so ecologists talk about primary forest people talk about old growth forest but essentially it's ancient woodland right so the original uh, forest vegetation which we have so little left in this country and so little being any idea of percentages? So little being probably 2 or 3 percent uh, versus, you know, 15 or so percent woodland cover. But the woodland cover includes secondary forests, so the, the regenerating areas, but also lots and lots of plantations. And we mm. talked already about how we shouldn't sort of conflate plantations with, with forests. Um, so essentially, in, in, in this vision of, of Ennerdale, we're seeing regeneration on the slopes and then uh, sort of a rewilding of the river in the valley bottom, so, so the river, like the Horsewater Project you, you flew over as well, is being left to take its natural course. They've got some sort of big hairy cows in there to, to browse that, which are, it's important to keep this sort of open habitats as well, for, uh, particularly there for some rare butterfly species that they've got on site. Uh, and, uh, and then sort of creating a mosaic of different habitats. So where before we've just largely got an area which intensively sheep grazed, you know, very little or, or, or little ruderal pats, patches of, of forest, uh, what we call the sort of clough woodlands in, across much of Oakland, Britain, but allowing that habitat to spread, having some scrubby areas and having some nice sort of uh, meadowlands as well. Uh, and it's also been a, a place which attracted lots of, lots of tourists, I guess as much of the Lake District does. Um, uh, but it's also still, you know, producing some agricultural produce in, in the form of this sort of organic and, and ethical beef, I guess. And in the, in the footage, though, in the background, you can see all the hills in behind are mostly fairly bare looking or yeah. the short growth of whatever that is. Lots, and especially lots of the northern part of the Lake District have still got uh, densities of sheep which are inhibiting natural regeneration, which are essentially uh, driving to local extinction, many plant species, and really sort of eroding the basis of that food web, which then you know, prevents uh, the accumulation of more biodiversity, which works itself up the food chain to, mm. to allow there to still be golden eagles in that system. But we're sort of slowly pushing back against that, against that picture, and I guess which you know, reached its sort of asymptote, reached its sort of worst part uh, with the sort of headage payments where farmers were, were basically paid per sheep which really encouraged real overstocking. So that, that policy subsequently removed and we're seeing a slow drawdown, but perhaps it could occur quicker in some areas and perhaps we can more, be more dynamic about the way grazing that happens, speaking about mob grazing or strip grazing mm. or, uh, and or you know, seeing other animals up on the slopes as well. I mean, rewilding essentially is still, uh, I guess it's a continuum of processes from, from wilder farming, uh, if you like, to, to full rewilding with a full complement of carnivores. But moving anywhere along that gradient is better than staying where we are at the better moment. Better than where we are at the moment. And so projects like Ennerdale and Horswater are great, but on their own, how significant are they really? Can we expand this across further areas in Britain without damaging our ability to produce food? I think we can. I think formally we're really hamstrung by the common agricultural policy. 
uh, and the need through this, the common agricultural policy to, to maintain land in an agriculture ready state. Uh, when I walk around the Peak District, I speak to farmers and saying, who tell me that you know if they're not going to be penalised for, for letting an area regenerate, which they would be under the cap, then that would happen because they can say, well, this area doesn't produce. You know, it's, the grazing's terrible there. You know, it's it's full of bracken. You know, we can let this regenerate. And, and previously, they've been unable to do that because it would come at a cost to them in the same way that hedgerows have come at a cost to farmers. So I think it's just a case of uh, making, giving, uh, sort of creating the financial conditions yeah. for those changes to happen. I think they will happen. The policy and financial framework needs to be there. Yeah, I also feel like farmers will do. They have a tendency to be incredibly, incredibly resourceful and innovative, and they, by nature, have to adapt to the weather conditions. I have complete faith that if all of that is put in place, then they will deliver as they did on, on food in the past. Absolutely. Um, do you think, though, that the British public, who are adoring those lovely stamps, that images of uh, the lakes and the peaks, which show fairly bare hills, do you think they can be convinced that those areas can be beautiful but different? Yeah, so I think beauty is a problematic term to use. I mean, it's a subjective idea. I saw, returning to Twitter, I saw a tweet about someone described that fire in the Gulf of Mexico as being toxically beautiful uh, and was raving about it. And in a way, parts of our landscape, upland landscapes might be a little toxically beautiful, uh, literally in the case of the, the western fringe of the Peach District where I live, because they're full of all these chemicals which have rained down from Manchester and the industrial cities and have, and have curtailed biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, and I think, well, beauty is subjective and it's, it's often things that are different, right? If you spend most of your life living in the centre of Manchester, going to the Peak District is subjectively beautiful. It's a completely different landscape with rolling topography, you know, a lot fewer people, well, except if you're there on sort of a bank holiday weekend, I guess. And it, that's, that beauty is entirely subjective. But as an ecologist, I can say a lot of these areas are often objectively poor for biodiversity because of their history of land use and in some cases because of ongoing land uses. So I think it's a case of education of, you know, we can, these areas will retain this beauty, subjective or not, uh, but, you know, we can do better uh, for them by biodiversity and, and for carbon. Are you convinced we can get your golden eagles back in uplands all across Britain? Uh, I, think, I think so, and not necessarily just in uplands. I've seen golden eagle hunting uh, among skyscrapers in, 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 in downtown Orange County in Southern California. And, uh, I've seen golden eagles uh, breeding at sea level in, in, in southern Sweden. We often think of things like golden eagles and as being creatures of the wilderness, but it's essentially where we drove them. You know, they were persecuted in the lowlands and they disappeared from them. Quite often these species do better in lowland areas which are more productive. Uh, red kite was another special bird, talking about my peregrinations in my youth going to, Scot going to the lakes to see uh, golden eagles. I went to see red kites in central Wales when there was only 30 or 40 pairs left in 1990 and and now sort of having driven from arable lincolnshire to there now they breed within two miles of my my parents house in, in south lincolnshire in in an arable landscape essentially because they, yeah. we stopped persecuting them and, mm -hmm. and they came back and and for a lot of these species that's all we need to do we need to do nothing we need to stop persecuting and they come back but for other species well we need to get the habitat right yeah and it's quite often that it's the these sort of charismatic species the hen harriers or the kites sort of get all the press coverage but they're the easiest things easiest parts of the problem to fix whereas if we want you know bog asphodel back or if we want, you know, small blueback, a butterfly, all these species, they require sort of specialist habitats that we need to build sort of from the ground up. I very much look forward to talking to you about all the other kinds of habitats we're about to see as we go around the country. Thank you very much okay. for, uh, for that. Super exciting to chat to you. One final question. You might have noticed on our expedition T-shirt, we're asking one big question, which is Britain drove the Industrial Revolution. Could we drive the Green Revolution too? Do you have a view on that? Uh, I think we could do. People are making the right sort of noises. Uh, politicians are making some of the right no sorts of noises and then uh, on the other flip side, often making the wrong sorts of choices immediately afterwards when it comes to um, sort of uh, continuing to, to sort of uh, uh, be cheerleaders for, for fossil fuels, for instance. But I think we are seeing something of a sea change. and. Uh, it, for me, uh, as a, a big supporter of the Uni European Union, perhaps the only sort of the plus point uh, for Brexit could be an ability to, 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 to go forth and create a, a better, uh, a better en environmental and agricultural policy uh, nexus, if you like. Whether that happens, I don't know. That's up to the politicians. But I think as, as members of the public, we need to be putting pressure on them to, to, to get those positive outcomes.
And do you reckon academics need to be a bit more vocal? I think academics are vocal these days. I mean, it's, it's all very well writing papers, but I think we, we need to be all over social media and, uh, and to be um, having our, making our voice heard. I mean, it's very easy to... It, uh, sort of accusations of, of sitting in the ivory tower, but these days we're, we're judged not not only based on the quality of the science, but also on that the ability of that science to 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 enact change and, and, and to produce measurable impact. So, uh, I'd hope we have a, a strong role to play in, in, in that fight. Thanks very much, Alex, for that. And yeah, very much look forward to talking to you about all the other landscapes we're going to be um, flying across uh, on the rest of the journey. We've got another two thousand eight hundred miles or something to go. Wow, so good luck with that. I'm super excited to be seeing those images and, and chatting to them about them and, and understanding a bit more about the, the history of these, the, these regions and how we can go about uh, creating a sort of more biodiverse and more carbon-rich future for the British landscapes. Yeah, a new vision. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.